Welcome back, everyone, to another Space News Rundown with me. We've got lots to talk about. On the menu, as always, are all the latest Starship updates from SpaceX. We've also got the flights of William Shatner and Lucy to talk about. And we've got a few launches to look forward to over the next seven days. So let's get right into it, beginning, as always, with all the latest news regarding Starship. It's been another busy week for SpaceX down at Boca Chica, where progress continues on both Ship 20 and Booster 4, as well as Starbase itself and future vehicles up to and including Booster 8. It really has been quite the wild ride watching the development of this rocket over the past couple of years. While it does feel like we've been watching the Silver Giant go through iterative testing for ages now, it's worth remembering that the very first flight tests with Starhopper were only a mere two years ago, and it's crazy to think of the progress that been made since then. As quaint as Starhopper seems now, at the time it was a very interesting sign of the direction SpaceX would be heading with the Starship program. This was a vehicle built out in the open and made from stainless steel, in contrast to more traditional modern materials such as the aluminium alloys seen on the Atlas V and Falcon 9, for example. SpaceX's reasoning for going with the heavier steel material is that it's cheap and it's fast, and can withstand much higher temperatures than aluminium, a crucial characteristic when designing a vehicle that not only needs to withstand the scorching temperatures of orbital re-entry, but also needs to be able to propulsively land itself and then get launched again with little to no refurbishment between flights. The first year of building and testing culminated in the August 2019 150-meter untethered flight of Starhopper. From there, we were treated to a year of bangs, flashes, and explosions as SpaceX continued to build and launch vehicles. Notable moments were the explosions of the Mark 1 Starship and SN3, which both failed during tanking tests. SN4 was the first full-scale prototype to not only pass cryogenic pressure testing, but also managed to successfully perform multiple static fires. Uh, prior to exploding. <laughs> SN5 and 6 were broadly identical and both sailed further than any previous full-scale Starship, not only completing tanking and static fire tests, but also managing to follow in the footsteps of Starhopper and conduct 150 meter hops of their own. After that, of course, Starship development reached what was probably the most exciting era the program has had so far, the high-altitude flight tests. These began with SN8, the first Starship to include a nose cone fairing, aerodynamic control surfaces, and three Raptor engines. SN8 performed far better than anyone expected, successfully reaching 12.5 kilometers, flipping to the belly flop descent position, and then successfully orienting back to vertical for landing, only to sadly hit the ground a little bit too hard after an engine failure. SN9, 10, and 11 all met similar fates, generally successful flights that ended in an explosion in one way or another, but we all know what came next, SN15, which on the 5th of May 2021 would go on to be the first ever Starship to perform a high altitude flight and safely land and then stay in one piece. And look, it still stands to this day. With SN15's success, suborbital testing could come to an end and SpaceX could turn toward the ultimate goal of the program, orbital flight. This began with prototype Super Heavy boosters, which included BN1, which was purely a manufacturing pathfinder, and BN3, the first full-scale booster to perform a static fire. And then Booster 4, which is what we're all presently watching with anticipation. This, as you all know, will be the first Super Heavy booster not only to fly, but to also carry a Starship upper stage from the launch pad all the way to an orbital trajectory. Booster 4 remains just to the side of the orbital launch platform, which it was removed from to allow SpaceX to add the Mechazilla catching arms, which, as we all know, is the massive system that will catch both the first stage Super Heavy and Starship upper stage, so that the vehicles can go without the need for heavy landing legs. This should be getting added to the tower imminently. It's hard to make out the arm structure from the ground, but this fantastic render from SpaceX 3D Creation Eccentric does a great job in showing the current setup. The arm system currently rests on a red frame structure from which it'll be hoisted and attached to the launch tower itself. The main arms are the two large appendages and the structure they're attached to is the carriage that'll move them up and down the tower via a system of pulleys to allow the system to lift and orient the booster and ship before flight and after landing. 
The installation of the catch system looks to be happening over the next few days, so I would anticipate that this will be the biggest thing to look forward to this week. Reddit user Flintsmith captured this shot of what appears to be a cable drag chain arriving at the launch site as well. A cable drag chain is used to control the motion of cables and protect them from damage and metal fatigue. This particular drag chain is likely here to help protect the cables for the catch arm system, but I'm sure its ultimate use will become apparent over the next few days. The other exciting thing, of course, is Starship 20. While Booster 4 is a bit stuck, unable to really be tested due to not being on its launch stand, Ship 20 is ready for static fire on suborbital pad B, which could happen any day now. After this, this vehicle will of course not be making some puny flight to about 10 kilometers, like the previous full-scale Starships did, but will be riding Booster 4 all the way to orbit. Ship 20 will then be subjected to what will be the biggest challenge the Starship program has ever faced, withstanding the extreme heat of re-entry. If it pulls this off, history will quite literally have been made, as this will not only mean that the Saturn V is finally dethroned as the biggest and most powerful orbital rocket to be brought to operation, but will also represent the first fully reusable spacecraft. Although the small caveat there is that of course Ship 20 and Booster 4 will be soft landing in the ocean and so won't ever fly again. But it'll be a proof that the concept works and these vehicles are only prototypes after all. They'll quickly be followed by Ship 21 and Booster 5, which are both extremely close to completion as well. Really, the only major things that need to happen are final stacking of the ship segments. This great image from Nick Antuini shows us just how far along Ship 21's nose cone tiles are, and is it just me, or does it look much cleaner than Ship 20? I wouldn't be surprised when comparing the finish of SN8 compared with SN16, the last full-scale starship before Ship 20, the differences in quality are pretty stark. SpaceX learns quickly. Brendan Lewis once again supplies us all with an excellent overview infographic of the state of these vehicles, but what's not here are the little scraps and sightings we've seen of vehicles even further down the production line. The furthest one from now that we have evidence of is this picture taken by Nick of Booster 8's 33 engine thrust puck, and who knows, there could be even more bits of future vehicles hidden away inside the tents. What we're all waiting for really is for the flight of Booster 4 and Ship 20, and right now the FAA's draft environmental assessment document for the flight is undergoing its comment period. If you live in America, and especially in Brownsville, Texas, then do go ahead and leave your comments in support of the launch. Local residents Austin Barnard and C. Nunez Images, who are friends of the show and their work features prominently in these videos, have already expressed their endorsement, and just last week we had this great video released of Brownsville residents and students organizing a big thank you celebration for SpaceX, it is a truly inspiring time to be living in right now. I'm certainly not the first person on YouTube to compare Starship development to this generation's Apollo program, and that's because the comparison is spot on. Make sure you're subscribed by hitting the button below and ringing the bell of course, so that you can stay up to date on this incredible story as I publish these updates every single Monday, and hey, if you want to like the video too, then I always really do appreciate it. But that's all I wanted to talk about for Starship this week, not a huge amount of stuff took place in the past week, but oh so much anticipation is building for both the installation of the Mechazilla arms and the static fire phase of Ship 20's test campaign. Lots of other exciting stuff took place last week beyond Starship development though, so let's take a look at what we saw. One of the more significant launches we saw was Blue Origin's latest new Shepard flight, NS-18, which took place on the 13th of October. This was the 18th launch for Blue Origin's new Shepard rocket and the second crewed launch for the vehicle. The crew of four consisted of Blue Origin's Vice President of Mission and Flight Operations, Audrey Powers, former NASA engineer Chris Beschwiesen, Vice Chair for Life Sciences and Healthcare at French software company Dassault Systems, Glenn De Vries, and last but certainly not least, Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner. And wow, doesn't he look good for 90 years young? He's now the oldest person to ever fly to space, surpassing Wally Funk's record of 82 years, which, interestingly, was set on the previous New Shepard flight. I reckon they should get 91-year-old Clint Eastwood for the next space flight to continue this record-breaking trend. Let's get a real space cowboy into space. Shatner offered some very touching words during and after the flight, beautifully articulating his experience of the overview effect, a shift in awareness reported by several astronauts during spaceflight where the fragility of the Earth and its atmosphere become overly apparent. What you have given me is the most profound experience I can imagine. I'm so 
filled with emotion about what just happened. I, I just, it's extraordinary, extraordinary. I hope I never recover from this. I hope that I can uh, maintain what I feel now. I, I don't want to lose it. I recommend just watching the webcast replay on Blue Origin's YouTube channel, which was extremely heartwarming to watch. While you're on the Blue Origin YouTube channel, you might notice that they've shared some more footage of New Glenn inside their construction hangar. It's nice to see that this rocket actually does sort of exist to some capacity, and hopefully we'll even get to see it finished and flight ready at some point in the not too distant future as well. Now, in addition to New Shepard, there were some orbital launches last week. The first was on the 14th of October and was the latest OneWeb launch from the Vostochny Cosmodrome with a Soyuz 2.1b carrying the next 36 OneWeb satellites into low Earth orbit. The next launch was also on the 14th, this time a Chinese Long March 2D, which carried eight satellites of varying purpose, as well as three additional CubeSats, again with varying purposes, to low Earth orbit. Next up, another Chinese launch took place on the 15th of October. This was the Shenzhou 13 mission, a Long March 2F carried the next three Taikonauts to the Chinese Tiangong space station. This flight marks the eighth crewed Chinese space flight, and about six and a half hours of flight later, it arrived at the station and docked with the Tianhe core module. This mission follows the launch and successful docking of the Tianzhu-3 cargo spacecraft on the 20th of September, which presumably carried supplies and equipment to facilitate the Shenzhou-13 mission. The crew are all now safely on board and will spend the next 180 days living on the space station. Best of luck to them. The final launch of the week was another exciting one. This was the much-anticipated Lucy mission. Lucy is a NASA space probe on a 12-year journey to eight different asteroids, Firstly, it'll visit asteroid 52246 Donald Johnson in the main belt, and then proceed to visit seven Jupiter Trojans, which are asteroids that share Jupiter's orbit around the Sun, sitting in its Lagrange points, either just ahead of the planet or just behind. I was actually contacted by some of the engineers working at Lockheed Martin who worked on the Lucy mission, so of course I had to ask what their top five facts are about the spacecraft. And so, in no particular order, number one, the spacecraft alone has over two miles or three kilometers of wiring inside it. Number two, Lucy's core team of engineers from Lockheed Martin, NASA, and Southwest Research Institute was over 500 people. Number three, the spacecraft has over 1.5 million physical lines of code in it and includes new algorithms that allow it to autonomously track the asteroid's targets as it approaches at an average speed of 15,000 miles per hour or 24,000 kilometers per hour. Number four, Lucy's solar arrays have to be very big since the spacecraft will be NASA's farthest solar-powered mission from the sun. If you were to unfurl both of them and then stand the spacecraft on its end, it'd span approximately 50 feet or 15 meters, which is about the height of a four to five story building. Number five, and continuing with the theme of the solar panels, at Earth, Lucy's solar arrays generate up to 18,000 watts. For reference, it takes about 60 watts to power a light bulb. 18,000 watts is enough to power your house and a few of your neighbors' houses as well. But all the way out at Jupiter distance, these arrays can only generate about 500 watts. Enough to maybe power a few room lamps, but not enough to run a microwave oven, for example, because Jupiter is just that much further away from the sun. I suppose in addition to supplying me with some cool facts about the mission, I should also give some big thanks to the folks at Lockheed for sending me some goodies. I watched the launch wearing my Lockheed socks, mission patch, and drinking out of my Lockheed Martin mug through a Lockheed Martin straw like a true supporter. I listened to Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds for it as well, given that that's the song that inspired the name of the fossil that then in turn inspired the name of this mission. Sadly, I can't play you the audio due to copyright issues, but I can distort the audio very slightly so that you can experience what I experienced. Did that, did, did that work? Mm, yeah, I, I might have distorted it a bit too much. It is the nature of the business, I'm afraid. <laughs> anyway, those were all the launches we saw last week. Which was your favourite? For me, it was definitely a toss-up between seeing Lucy launch and getting to hear William Shatner's touching reflection on his trip to space. There are some more rocket launches coming up this week, so let's take a look at those now. 
The first launch of the week will be on the 19th of October and will be a Kawazu 1A launching a Chinese Earth observation satellite from the Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. Next up is a big one, it's the maiden flight of South Korea's first indigenously developed orbital launch vehicle. On the 21st of October, the Nuri will launch from the Naro launch site, carrying a dummy test payload into low Earth orbit. It's great to see countries advancing their space programs, especially from the perspective of someone whose government cancelled their orbital launch program, so I really hope this flight test is successful. The South Korean government said that they used SpaceX as a role model for their rockets, striving to develop relatively cheap and reliable vehicles competitive enough for the commercial launch market. Next up on the 23rd of October, an Ariane 5 will be launching from the Kourou launch site in the French Guiana. On board Ariane Space's flagship rocket will be two communication satellites, SCS-17 and Syracuse 4A, which will both be placed into geosynchronous Earth orbit. The Ariane 5 will, of course, be launching the James Webb Space Telescope later this year, so we're all now watching with bated breath with each Ariane 5 flight to hopefully see it maintain its reliable track record ahead of the historic telescope launch later this year. But that's the final launch expected to take place this week, which wraps up this section of the video and therefore also the video itself. I do hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, please consider leaving a like down below as it really does help support what I do here. And hey, if you want to go one step further like these fantastic folk on the left did, then you can sign up to my Patreon via the description or on-screen link. Or of course, you could alternatively join the Lounge Squad by hitting join below the video to get videos early when possible and to get a badge by your name and some exclusive emojis to use in the comments as well. Aside from that, once again, thank you all so much for watching, and if you want to check out more from my channel, then there are now two video suggestions on screen for you. But that's it, I've said my piece. 